Okay, welcome to CNI Jerusalem Calling. This is your source for unfiltered Mideast talk radio. I'm your host today, Ambassador Edward Peck. Now, you are listening to the Washington Times Network. Today, you are going to hear an interview with Ambassador Jack Matlock, who has served the United States government for over 50 years, both as a diplomat and as a scholar, representing the United States as the ambassador to Czechoslovakia and to the Soviet Union. And he has been the special assistant to the president and the senior director of European and Soviet affairs on the National Security Council. And last May, just less than a year ago, Ambassador Matlock led a delegation of the Council for the National Interest on a political pilgrimage, a fact-finding mission through the Middle East. In addition, Ambassador Matlock's most recent book is called Superpower Illusions, How Myths and False Ideologies Led America Astray and How to Return to Reality. Publishers Weekly has said that this book is new and persuasive and provocative, and it corrects a number of myths about the Cold War, including the beliefs that it ended with the fall of the Soviet Union and that the U.S. effectively won. Today, we're going to use Ambassador Matlock as a source for thoughtful and provocative information on the Middle East, basing it largely on the extensive experience he has had at the senior levels of the United States government in conducting relations with other countries. Ambassador Matlock, can you tell the listeners what motivated you to write this book, Superpower Illusions?, I found that there were widespread misunderstandings about what happened to end the Cold War and how it came about, and that these misunderstandings uh, supported a number of actually disastrous decisions on the part of uh, both President Clinton, but even more so during the Bush-Cheney administration. I tried to set forth a number of these in the book, uh, one of them being uh, that the Cold War, ending it was like a military victory. Well, it was not. It was a negotiated end, and one that really both sides won, because it, the end of it was the, in the interest of the Soviet Union. And another myth is that economic and military pressure brought down the Soviet Union. No internal pressures within the Soviet Union that were released after the Cold War ended brought down the Soviet Union. Then there's the idea that the U.S. somehow defeated communism by use of its economic and military power. Now, communism was a failed system, and it failed after we ended the arms race and took the pressure off from the outside. So, uh, yes, communism was defeated, but not in a sense was the Soviet Union, because we ended the Cold War. It gave President Gorbachev the opportunity to try to reform the Soviet Union and correct some of its problems. That attempt to reform failed because of internal pressures. So all of these things sort of went into the idea that the United States emerged at the end of the Cold War as with something like a military victory. Yes, our system prevailed, and theirs didn't. But uh, that is not the same as a military victory. And in particular, it did not leave us the sole superpower in the sense that we could remake the world without allies, without using the diplomatic techniques and efforts that brought an end to the Cold War. Ambassador Matlock, inasmuch as they're now celebrating almost the deification of President Reagan, who defeated the Soviet Union and won the Cold War and all the rest of that, it's going to be difficult, uh, even with a well-written book such as yours, to get the American public, which you know is neither well-informed nor terribly interested about the rest of the world, to understand that. Have you have you had reactions to what you've written that you could share with us? Well, most of the reactions I've had, I think, have been positive. And I would say you don't have to go to my book to understand these things. Go to Reagan's memoirs. He himself never claimed that we won the Cold War in a military way. He himself never claimed that it was we who brought down communism. He gave Gorbachev credit for that. The idea that uh, Reagan would never have claimed later that his speech 
Mr. Gorbachev bring down that wall yeah. was what brought it down. <laughs> uh, Gorbachev's actions later permitted it, but not because of that speech. I would say, uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at what Reagan himself wrote. And there have been several books on that, including his memoirs. You and I would perhaps agree that uh, <laughs> despite, despite what you just said, there still remains an awful lot of Americans who don't understand. In as much as, you know, you just led the pilgrimage less than a year ago off to the Middle East, which was not an area on which you focused personally in the career, but certainly was, which was one that touched on so many of the things that you did during your, your long... Absolutely. Can... I was also consul on Zanzibar. Um, yeah. during the 67 war, for example. So I served all around uh, the area, and uh, those issues were important. But you're right, I did not serve directly in the area before. Nonetheless, you could make some comparisons between the U.S. standoff with the Soviets and the continued occupation of Palestine by the Israelis in terms of discussing what it is that America sees and understands about its role in that part of the world. There were certain lessons that I believe that Ronald Reagan in particular understood when we were negotiating the end of the Cold War, which have been forgotten. Now, one of these is you talk to everybody. You don't say they're preconditioned. We'll only talk to you if you agree with us on something. We constantly talk to the Soviet Union, even after crises when Korean airliner was down or an American was shot in East Berlin. Second, he understood that when you talk to them, you start by talking about common interests. You try to find things that both sides can agree on. His effort was not to bring down the Soviet government. He understood very well, if we attempt to do that from the outside, we strengthen them. We never talked about regime change, but he tried to change the attitude of the Soviet leadership, understanding that he had to convince them that it was in their interest to change a number of their aggressive policies. And that was, uh, with Gorbachev, that became spectacularly successful as an approach. Now, the idea that since then that there are elements that are important in the Middle East we don't talk to unless they agree to this or that, I think, have hampered getting a settlement. I think we should be talking to everybody, and we should be talking to them with an aim of finding what the common interests are, and not focusing just on, on, on the latest crisis, but focusing on the long term. What is going to make it possible to create peace in the area? And if, if we focus on that, I think we'll be more successful, and we should be in communication with all of the elements that have a role in the area. That's sort of the subtitle of your book, How Myths and False Ideologies Led America Astray. And so, therefore, you would definitely apply these same descriptions of problems to what it is that uh, is and is not happening in the Middle East. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, in the sense that, well, two groups of people are very important in bringing about a solution uh, and that we're not talking to. Now, we don't have to recognize them as countries, but we should be in communication. One of these is Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the other is Hamas. Yes, they have created terrorist acts in the past. Uh, we want to deter them from doing so in the future. The Soviet Union supported terrorism many places in the world. We didn't say we're not going to talk to them until they stop. We tried to convince them it was in their interest to stop, and it was. We passed up opportunity after opportunity in the 90s and uh, during the Bush-Cheney administration to talk more broadly with Iran. If we had done so, we would be in a much better position today, I believe, in dealing with the problems there. We have inherited a policy of, in effect, saying, come out with your hands up before we will talk, and mm. it doesn't work. It clearly does not. It wouldn't work with us. I don't know why we expect it to work with others, <laughs> Ambassador Matlock. It's interesting to hear you discuss these things because I've, I have the feeling, which perhaps you share, that an awful lot of Americans still do not understand what it is that you're saying. I remember that at the height of the Cold War, when the United States knew without any equivocation that the Soviets were capable at enormous cost of blasting us off the face of the earth. They had an embassy here, we had an embassy there, we had commissions and delegations and exchanges and all kinds of things going on, even though that was a problem. Welcome back to CNI Jerusalem Calling. Today we're speaking with Ambassador Jack Matlock a veteran of many years of experience at the senior levels in the U.S. government dealing 
principally with the Soviet Union and its challenges, and now focusing a bit of his attention on how America can get back on the track by overlooking some of the myths and false ideologies which have led the nation astray. And his book is entitled Superpower Illusions, which is something that you need to read to understand what's going on. Ambassador Matlock, last May you led a delegation on a political pilgrimage sponsored by the Council for the National Interests through six countries in the Middle East. Yes, and it and was which a fascinating you, experience. Yes, your, your group met with and spoke with uh, people from all sides of the questions, including uh, two of the groups that you mentioned we don't really speak to as a nation, Hezbollah and Hamas. What conclusions did you come away with on the basis of that very interesting experience, which I myself took three times before? What can you tell the listeners well, you know, it was a yeah. deeply moving experience in many respects to uh, travel and talk to really all the parties uh, in the area. I guess my overall conclusion is that the parties around Israel are ready for a settlement, one that would be based on the borders and principles that have already been approved by the U.N. and its famous Resolution 242. But at the same time, there is a very strong sense of humiliation by the peoples all around Israel. And this sense of humiliation, the feeling that they're not being treated as human beings, that their human rights are being systematically violated, uh, that the Israelis are demanding absolute security for themselves and absolute insecurity for all their neighbors. And, of course, psychologically, this is not the basis on which, you know, a settlement uh, could be reached in the long run. This, again, brought to mind our negotiations during the Cold War, when at one point, as we now know, now that we can read Politburo records, uh, after about two years of the Reagan-Gorbachev uh, uh, interaction, Gorbachev started telling the Politburo, our problem is we have sought absolute security for the Soviet Union, which means absolute insecurity for everybody else. Comrades, that is not sustainable. Uh, we have got to recognize others' rights to their own security and their freedom of choice. Uh, this was the signal that he was willing to withdraw from Eastern Europe and so on. This principle is one that I found that, yes, I think all the parties are yearning for peace, but it must be a peace that respects everybody and, and that treats people alike in terms of their rights. We have a call coming in. Uh, David, I think you're on the line with a question. Can you ask it now? My question has to do with media and their role in the illusions. Not to denigrate Mr. Matlock's work, but there are other authors who have written books along the same line. I watched an excellent video called The Power of Nightmares that makes the same point. And my question is, do you feel our media give us what we want and we really don't want to know about the rest of the world, or are they deliberately trying to deceive us? There is a lot of disinformation out in the media, not so much by the media, but by people that are trying to frame the debate in given ways, and sometimes they misrepresent or misinterpret what happened in the past. There is that. I don't think there is a media conspiracy to do this. I think that's, uh, that's exaggerated. But I do think that the mainstream media don't always do the best job of exposing, um, I would say, misinterpretations uh, uh, when, when they come. That's interesting, David. Your question is very perceptive and uh, very important, too, as a matter of fact. Um, and Ambassador Matlock, you've answered it. I was going to ask a question about this myself, if I might, sir. The other thing that David touched on, or at least he implied, was that Americans don't really care that much. And I think that it's safe to say that our nation is not famed for the breadth and depth of its understanding of the rest of the world. Certainly in the case of the Middle East, where it brings in uh, politics and religion and history and all sorts of things that are complicated, and Americans would sooner spend their time uh, worrying, as they should, about the economy and the rest of it, and don't spend a great deal of time thinking about that. So when you take that into consideration, what do you think that the United States could do as a nation in order to remedy this dwindling credibility, not just with the Arab world, but as General Petraeus said, it's a dangerous thing for us and our troops out there because of this very close relationship the United States has always had. Yes, I, uh, I think you make a, an excellent point. But most people just don't have time or attention or, for that matter, easy access to 
completely reliable information. And, of course, these issues tend to be extraordinarily complex. And so much of public opinion tends to be driven by fairly small groups of people who, quite frankly, have an axe to grind. Now, I think most Americans are very committed to supporting uh, the state of Israel. And once they understand that the question is not supporting Israel within borders that uh, have been internationally approved, but the current question is the problem that the current Israeli government is trying to force a change in these borders and to force the ethnic cleansing of the people who are not Jewish uh, from the area, even outside the borders uh, that are recognized, that that is a basic problem. And as long as we are seen in the Middle East to be supporting that policy, uh, it is going to create problems for us. Americans are going to die because of attacks on us, and your terrorists are going to be motivated to try to come after us. So I think once there is greater understanding of this, there should be better understanding that we can best support Israel by a form of tough love to say, yes, we will support you within the borders that everybody recognizes if you will live within them and will make a deal with the others to live in peace with them and not try to dominate a particular area and force out the people who have been living there for centuries. I believe most Americans would understand that and that to try to induce the Israeli government to do what is in its own interest is in support of Israel's long-term interest and not in any way anti-Israel. It's interesting that you put it that way. I I see that uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, in speaking to uh, the AIPAC, I guess, uh, she reiterated uh, and underlined that word, I think, the call to the Palestinians to recognize Israel. Now, you with your diplomatic background, and I'll, I'll add mine on the side, recognition is usually a reciprocal arrangement in which we recognize you while you recognize us. And I recall once hearing somebody very prominent on the Palestinian side saying that, you know, if you're going to recognize Israel, you're recognizing not a name but a state. Where are the borders? And if we recognize Israel, shouldn't Israel recognize Palestine at the same time? That's how diplomacy is done. Is is that a correct interpretation? Governments of states recognize (laughs) other states. And until you have a state in Palestine and Israel has a defined border, you know, the question is abstract. But my point is that I think it is very clear what the only feasible settlement is if you want two states in the area of uh, historic Palestine. And that is an Israel within the borders approved by Resolution 242 with whatever changes they can negotiate. And an a Palestinian state, which has to have its capital in East Jerusalem, uh, that, that I think is a sine qua non, um, uh, not only for the Palestinians, but for most of the surrounding states. It seems to me it's very clear what the end settlement is likely to be if you want two states. Now, if you want a democratic state, a single state, it must be a democratic state that recognizes everybody. It can't be a Jewish state. It can't be an Islamic state. It can't be a Christian state. But that would be the other option if we're thinking uh, abstractly. If you want a Jewish state, the only viable future is going to be with an associated Palestinian state. And uh, it seems to me it is so much in Israel's long-term interest if they want a Jewish state is to promote that. At, rather than undermine it with their settlement policy and so on. This is Ambassador Edward Peck. Welcome you back to CNI Jerusalem Calling, program of Council for the National Interest. Today, we have the pleasure and the honor of speaking with Ambassador Jack Matlock, a diplomat with many years of experience at the senior levels of the U.S. government, including being ambassador to Czechoslovakia and to the Soviet Union. Ambassador Matlock, one of the things that interested me recently was the request of the Argentines that the United States become the mediator in their forthcoming dispute with Great Britain over drilling for oil in the Falkland Islands. And as I read it in the press, uh, Secretary of State Clinton, in response, said, no, no, it's much more productive if the two of you talk to each other. What a fascinating concept, one which we haven't implied, applied recently with Iran. My own question is, can we effectively play a role in trying to halt 
Iran's uh, presumed nuclear program, while at the same time never mentioning the fact that Israel has nuclear weapons, does that kind of limit the credibility we have in raising this issue with other people? Well, it does. I think there's several things, uh, thoughts there. One is that there's probably no worse time to try to negotiate with uh, the Iranian government than now with all of their internal problems. There is no assurance, given our current policies, even with sanctions, we're going to prevent them continuing to develop a nuclear capacity. I don't think that's a good thing. I think it's dangerous for the area. I don't think it is an existential threat to Israel if they should get nuclear arms, because Israel does have nuclear weapons and could wipe out Iran if they tried, and they know that. So I don't think we should dramatize it. I do think one thing, and that is the worst thing that could be done in the current situation is for either Israel or the United States to attack those nuclear facilities. Uh, I think that's exactly, in my opinion, what President Ahmadinejad wants. He wants an external attack so he can rally Iranians on nationalistic grounds to support his failing regime. And the idea that you solve this by bringing increasing pressure to bear on Iran puts it just backwards. We have to think about our overall nuclear strategy. I'm very pleased we're finally uh, coming to a new agreement with the Soviet Union to continue the arms re nuclear reductions we've had in the past. And I think we have to continue to move toward the goal of zero, because if we're going to control proliferation, not just in Iran, but other places, how can we tell one country you can't have nuclear arms when we ourselves say we can't do without them? We won't be safe. This just doesn't make sense. Not only the United States, but also, of course, Israel has to think about this in the long run. Now, the uh, reduction to zero uh, obviously has to be by stages, but we have to consider that not simply an impossible goal, but one that is realistically possible if we continue in that direction. And I think if we're able to do so, it will strengthen our efforts to control proliferation. But we have to make the point that these things don't help, that they are dangerous actually to the country that has them. We're not making that point so far with our policies, though I hope we're on the way toward doing so. I agree with your assessment in totality, Ambassador Madlock. One of the things that has interested me, and perhaps you as well, but having spent much of my adult life living in and working on the Middle East, is the very obvious, and we are quite proud of it, I suppose, the obvious bias we have uh, towards Israel. I don't recall ever having heard an American leader make any reference to the fact that Israel has a nuclear weapons. You know, we talk about Iran and such things as that, but we've never, nobody's ever said, and by the way, there's another problem out there, which if, if country X has nuclear weapons, country Z is certainly going to want them uh, as a deterrent, not necessarily as an offensive weapon. Uh, your comments on that, sir? The Israeli government will not officially admit that they have them. I think there, there have even been court cases of Israelis who have talked publicly about this. I think that's a rather dangerous um, uh, situation. I think that uh, Israel uh, does have a nuclear capacity, which they depend upon. And they may argue that as long as there is an existential threat, as long as the rhetoric of some of their enemies uh, talk about wiping them off the map, they have to have this. But I think we've got to learn to move beyond it and not simply say flatly, uh, country X, country Y, it is totally unacceptable for you to develop a capacity, particularly when they claim they're not. What you have to do is to have the diplomacy to convince them that it is not in their interest to have uh, nuclear weapons. And our actions up to now have not conveyed that idea. When we think about it, the United States does not attack countries that have nuclear weapons. And yet President Bush, the second President Bush, talked about an axis of evil. Arguably, these countries uh, were, had evil regimes, but uh, I don't know that there was an axis. And then he attacks one of them, saying that we have to attack them before they get nuclear weapons. He doesn't attack North Korea. Uh, he doesn't attack Iran. But the implication is we will. What is the lesson that a country is going to take from that? We better get them, and we better get them in a hurry because the United States doesn't attack countries with nuclear weapons. We don't always understand the implications of our policies, and others would say, you know, the Clinton administration never would have bombed Serbia over Kosovo. Uh, Serbia hadn't attacked any other country. We bombed them in an act of war, 
uh, if they had had nuclear weapons, we wouldn't do it. So we have to understand the rest of the world can look at nuclear weapons as the ultimate guarantee that the United States will not come in and bomb them or occupy them. And that's why, you know, somehow we have got to begin to take these things off the table if we're going to deal with proliferation. Going back to David's question earlier uh, when he was asking about the media, uh, you used the phrase about wiping Israel off the face of the earth, and I have heard from many reliable sources that that is not what Ahmadinejad said. What he said was that the, the Zionist regime uh, should uh, disappear, yeah. which is a much different thing. A trip and maybe lost well, that's right. I was speaking of perceptions. No, I understand. Yeah, of course, Israeli well, perceptions. Yeah. Not that that is the fact. I don't. Yeah. I don't think any significant force is determined to force the Israelis into the sea and to wipe, wipe them off the map in the sense of a of, a, of another Holocaust. That's not what the problem is. Well, but the Israelis, uh, the perception in Israel. I think, has driven a reaction which is actually counterproductive to their own interests. It's, uh, it's interesting that, that you mention this, because so often you see that uh, from certain sources in our country that the United States should do something to pressure Israel to change its policies, whereas from your own experience, it's certainly mine, nobody's going to be able to do that. Uh, we're not going to threaten Israel with war. So the only way to get them to consider changing their policies, and it might be quite difficult with the current regime, of course, is to get them to reconsider what it is that you're talking about, that you live in peace and security when your neighbors are also living in peace and security. But what can the American administration do now other than its rather fumbling, hesitant approach to get the Israelis to see the wisdom of that kind of thing? We only have a couple of minutes before the break, but I thought I'd lay this question out for you to... uh, to consider. Go ahead, sir. Well, I, I think we have to make it clear uh, that um, our support for Israel uh, is an Israel which has been internationally approved. We uh, cannot continue to wink at or support the expansionist policies and some of the others. I think that will help the Israeli public to understand that they've got to stop letting the tail wag the dog in their own uh, political process. These uh, extremist groups that seem to be able to control the process when 70 or 80 percent of the people would want something different. Somehow the Israelis, I think, need to come to terms with that. Maybe that is where the Obama administration is in a fumbling way, but is pushing at this time. Doing it very gently because no one in their right mind uh, should want anything bad to happen to a single Israeli or Palestinian or American. But the kind of grim truth is that bad things have happened to all three groups and will probably continue to happen to all three groups uh, as long as this expansionist policy and the blockading of the people in Gaza, which, by the way, in U.S. legal definition of international terrorism, attempting to coerce or intimidate a civilian population is called, in our own laws, international terrorism, which is what that is, is happening there now. We are continuing our interview with Ambassador Jack Matlock, the author of a recently very interesting and powerful book called Superpower Illusions, How Myths and False Ideologies Led America Astray and how to return to reality. Uh, Sir, continuing our discussion of the Middle East, which is the focus, of course, of CNI's Jerusalem Calling program, General Petraeus, a man who has considerable respect uh, in this nation, recently called attention of of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Congress to the costs to America in lives of our Uh, commitment to and unhesitating support for pretty much everything Israel wants to do. Would you uh, comment on what he has said and what it could mean for us? Well, I think that wasn't a very important statement, and one that I think will resonate with the American public. I think it is absolutely obvious to us who observe the regime what seems to be um, an American policy of supporting or excusing almost everything the Israeli government does, uh, no matter how detrimental to its neighbors, has caused a degree of anti-Americanism and has given rise uh, to a lot of the terrorism which is uh, now directed at us. This is a problem for our military commanders. I think the American public really needs to understand it. If you combine that, with an understanding that these expansionist policies by Israel, the attempt of Israel to humiliate its neighbors and to prevent 
a viable Palestinian state because they, they have tended to undermine uh, the efforts even when they have formally uh, accepted the idea. As long as that goes on, it is going to make us targets as well. And therefore, these policies are certainly not in America's interest, but I would also argue they're not in Israel's interest. This is a very fundamental point, and I hope that the American people will begin to focus on this, that the best way we can help Israel create a free, democratic, peaceful state in the Middle East is to dissuade them from these policies that are making that impossible. This brings me back to the question from the caller, uh, David, who was on before. To people like myself uh, who have you know, worked on that area fairly extensively over the years, it was fairly obvious that so much of what is considered to be hostility towards the United States is a reflection and a reaction to our unhesitating and unstinting support, protection, and arming of Israel. And yet the Petraeus thing broke, and then it kind of goes away, it dies off, and nobody pays much attention. Even to use another word to which you referred, humiliation, in which they're humiliating the Palestinians and other. But we recently had an experience in which the United States government, in the personage of Mitchell, and certainly in the case of Biden, but going all the way back to, uh, to the Baker when he was Secretary of State, every time an American goes over to talk about peace and limiting uh, extremism and all of that, the Israelis make an announcement which essentially consists of making an obscene gesture in public to the United States, its only significant supporter and ally, and the American public uh, seems to just kind of blink and then go on about its business without the media spending much time talking about the costs of this in terms of American money, American respect, and now, of course, American lives. Maybe now if People like General Petraeus will continue speaking out, and I think also Admiral Mullen would certainly uh, share many of these thoughts. If they speak out, maybe that will help change uh, the situation. I think you've described the situation up to now very well, and this is one of the reasons that so many Americans really don't understand the essence of what is at issue. And how do we correct that? Do you have any suggestions that you could lay out for the public, for the listeners, as to what might be done to get American media to play an appropriate role in keeping Americans informed of what the realities are? Well, I think those of us with contacts there, with experience there, have to keep talking, writing, trying to explain the realities. And I think also that we are seeing a quite new spirit on the part of younger Jewish Americans. I'm very encouraged by organizations like J Street, many others who understand uh, that causes that some of their elders seem to support unthinkingly are really not in Israel's interest and certainly not in the American interest. And I do think that pro-Israeli people in the United States, and I think almost all of us are pro-Israeli in the ultimate sense, are learning more about the realities. It may take time, but I think we have to be patient and simply continuing trying to explain uh, what the facts are, what the myths are, which I try to expose in my book, uh, that have led us astray and try to get us back to a reality. Our politics are now so fractured that there's always a danger that leaders of one party or the other are going to try to use these issues for essentially internal things. And I think as Americans, we need to object to that. Uh, I don't think that... Uh, uh, our policy in the Middle East should be a partisan issue. I don't think there's anything liberal or conservative in the extreme sense about these issues. It's what's in the interest of the United States and ultimately also what is in the long-time interest of an Israel if it wishes to live in that neighborhood in peace and security. I'd just like to bounce one last question off of you, if I can, Ambassador Matlock. Something that's interested me is that Americans, almost all of them from all sides of this question, seem to use a vocabulary which is misleading. We talk about a peace process, and the implication is that there's a war going on. And, of course, there isn't a war. There's an occupation. And a peace process talks about two sides with armies and borders, you know, contending. But the Palestinians don't have borders, nor do they have an army. We also talk about ending the conflict, but there is no conflict. There's an occupation. And the third thing that really distresses me is we keep talking about resuming negotiations, whereas it would seem fairly obvious to me, at least, sir, that 
the prisoners don't negotiate with the guards. And so it's not a negotiation with two equal sides sitting down to talk, and a boss maybe doesn't have to go through cavity searches if he goes to these sessions, but he certainly is not able to negotiate as an equal with somebody like Netanyahu. Your comments, please, sir. Well, I think that is absolutely right, and that's probably the reason that I, I think the time has come, as soon as it's politically feasible in the United States, for the United States and the EU and other interested outside powers to spell out the general terms of what they think a settlement would be and one that we could support. I think it's not going to come about by negotiation between the parties precisely for the reasons you say. And now, the parties should negotiate any exchanges of territory and things like that. But I think uh, we should, uh, those outsiders who are interested, should start with the legal situation as we see it and say, all right, this is what we will support. Uh, we will not support efforts of either side to change without negotiation any of these basic elements. Thank you, sir. Uh, and if we make that clear, perhaps that will help. We've, we've come to the end of the program. You are listening to the Washington Times Network on WSRadio.com. You've been listening to Ambassador Jack Matlock, the author of a book, Superpower Illusions, How Myths and False Ideologies Led America Astray and How to Return to Reality. America Astray and How to Return to Reality. America Astray and How to Return to Reality.